Servus everyone! Today, I am going to start a multi-part series about a motherboard I own since about 22 years. This motherboard is none other than the famous Asus P55T2P4. Originally released in June 1996, this motherboard from Asus earned its place among one of the most influential motherboards in history. Although a lot is dependent on the revision of the motherboard, each iteration contributed to its fame. But more about this later. So what is so unique about it? To answer this question, we have to go back in time for about 25 years. Let's have a look at the CPUs that were available around the time this motherboard was released. In 1992, there were a few companies that produced computer chips. IBM, Texas Instruments, AMD and Cyrix were some of the companies which produced 486 compatible processors. I will focus mainly on Intel for this timeline but for comparison, I will also show some releases from AMD. As I said, in 1992, chip manufacturers were still heavily producing 486 CPUs, which could reach a maximum frequency of 66 MHz. Intel released its first Pentium processors in 1993, with frequencies of 60 and 66 MHz. Although AMD released a higher clocked 486 chip the same year, the Pentiums were on par or even outperforming the higher clocked 486 line. In 1994, Intel released its first 100 MHz chips. Not only did Intel release a 100 MHz Pentium, it also released a 100 MHz 486 chip, which was probably released to have a product in their portfolio to compete in the Socket 3 market. The year 1995 marked the end of the 486 era with AMD releasing its final chip clocked at 133 MHz. Although higher clocked versions were planned, they were never released. Intel continuously increased the clock speed of the Pentium line. The final version of the original Pentium was released in June 1996 with a clock speed of 200 MHz. AMD released the K5 line to compete with Intel's Pentium family. So what does all of this have to do with our motherboard? If you look at the bus speeds for the Intel Pentiums, you can see that all of those chips had a bus speed of 66 MHz. The bus speed determines how much data can move between the CPU and other chips on the motherboard. In parentheses, I also show the internal multiplier that is used by the processor to get to its final speed. For instance, a 66 MHz bus speed with a multiplier of 3 will result in 200 MHz processor speed. There were other Pentium models that had a 60 or even a 50 MHz bus speed. However, the bus speed was partly responsible for the overall performance of the computer. Therefore, the higher the bus speed, the better the performance of the computer. Dr. Thomas Pabst, the founder of Tom's Hardware, wrote articles about overclocking at a time when overclocking consumer electronics was still in its infancy. He had some interesting things to say about the Asus P55T2P4. The Asus board offered a few non-standard bus speeds. The most interesting ones were 75 and 83 MHz. Now, there were more possibilities to run a CPU at different configurations. For instance, a stock Intel Pentium 166 would run with 66 MHz bus speed and a multiplier of 2.5. So 66 MHz bus speed multiplied by 2.5 gives a CPU frequency of 166 MHz. But now one could run the CPU at 83 MHz bus speed and a multiplier of 2, which also results in a CPU frequency of 166 MHz. The CPU clocks at the same frequency, however, the performance with a higher bus speed was superior to the stock configuration. 
What was even more interesting was the fact that it was also outperforming the Pentium 200 at stock speeds. You can imagine that Intel wasn't very happy that a lower tier CPU could match or even outperform the top tier CPU. Nevertheless, Dr. Pabst's website and the articles he published were partly responsible for spreading the information. Overclocking became more mainstream. The Asus P55T2 P4 was so well received that other manufacturers copied its features. It was considered the standard by which overclocking friendly motherboards were measured. Let's talk quickly about the two revisions of the motherboard I have. We have already seen revision 2.3. When comparing it to revision 3.1, we cannot see many differences on the left hand side. However, the right side has quite a few changes. First, the expansion slot for the onboard level 2 cache is gone. Revision 3.1 comes by default with 512 kilobytes. Second, below the socket we can see that the power delivery system is completely reworked. Not only did it receive an upgrade, from now on it can supply a CPU with two different voltages. Pentium MMX and the AMD K6 family of processors had a split voltage rail and required different voltages for core and I.O. Unfortunately, revision 2.3 does not support those features. As I mentioned before, I want to create multiple videos about this motherboard and dedicate one episode to a specific topic. Depending on the topic, I will use either revision 2.3 or 3.1 of this motherboard. I have already done the introduction and a bit of history, but all coming videos will be hands-on. In the next video, I will reassemble the motherboard and place it in an AT case and see if it's actually working. In the third video, we extend the onboard level 2 cache with a coast module. Coast stands for cache on a stick. I will also check the 64 MB cacheable memory area limitation and increase it by using a tag RAM module. Since the motherboard has a USB connector, I also want to try to see if I can get USB to work under Windows 98. As I have an AMD K62 rated at 300 MHz, I want to see if I can install it and run it in one of those motherboards. I also don't know what BIOS versions are currently installed on those motherboards, but I'm attempting to flash the boards with the latest version that is available and see if I can remove some of the limitations that may be limiting the capabilities of those boards. I kept two videos for last as they require physical board modifications. The K62 will not run at 300 MHz by default, because the motherboard only supports a maximum multiplier of 3.5. The K6, however, requires a multiplier of 4.5. Therefore, I will add the so-called BF2 jumper to the motherboard. This will require soldering. Also, the battery has died in one of the boards and needs replacement. Unfortunately, the battery is enclosed inside the Dallas real-time clock casing. I will attempt to desolder the module, install a socket and add a casing for a regular button cell battery. I hope you are as excited as I am. Looking forward to see you in the next videos.